<clears throat> Mr. Green peered over his fence and noticed that the neighborhood little boy was in his backyard filling in a hole. Curious about what the youngster was up to, Mr. Green asked, What are you doing, Jimmy? Tearfully, little Jimmy replied, My goldfish died and I've just buried him. That's an awful large hole for a goldfish, isn't it, Mr. Green said? Patting down the last bit of earth on top of the gravesite, little Joey replied, that's because he was in your cat's mouth. <laughs> he was in your cat's mouth. If you were here last week, you'll know that we, uh, we took some time to go back and look at some of the happenings on what's typically called Pentecost Sunday. It's that part in the Bible that's spoken of in Acts chapter 2. And I shared with you, I started by saying that one of the things that, that I think we must think about, that we must pray about, that we must um, consider is that why, is, why does it not seem that our message is as compelling as the one that Jesus brought? It seems to me when you read the, uh, the gospel account that while there were many objectors to what Jesus said and did, there were a whole lot of people who were attracted to what he had to sh say and do. And, and when I look at how, there, in his absence, him transferring his legacy and the goods to his earliest of followers, if you begin in the book of Acts, you seem to discover that likewise, their message and methods seem to have a compelling component to them. Like, there are several occasions where you can read where thousands of people were added to the church in one day. And, and when you think about the population of the world at that time, right, uh, and what it is today, you'd have to multiply that, and percentage-wise, you'd have to multiply that so that there were, you know, a half a million added to the church in one day kind of thing. So we talked about some of, the, some of the aspects of what transpired at Pentecost. We talked, I shared with you a little bit about the, the, un, the releasing of God's power upon those earliest of followers. And then we talked about the practices that God led them to engage in so that they might be able to sustain and and, and, and continue to, uh, to live in that flow of God's presence and power, and they wouldn't blow up because of it, right? They wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, uh, handle it in an inappropriate way. So if you didn't get an opportunity to listen to that or hear that, I would encourage you to go to YouTube or whatever. If you type it in, the date, the, the place, the time, that what. That and whatnot, you can find um, find what you're looking there. Today, I'd like to call what I want to say to you, I'd like to title it, Increasing in Power. Increasing in Power. Last fall, uh, I think it was sometime in early October, Pastor Josh and I had the opportunity to go to a, a one-day enrichment uh, seminar, teaching, whatever you want to call it, at Elam, and there was a speaker there by the name of John Tyson. I'd never heard of him before. I'd never encountered his, you know, online or anywhere else, his ministry, and, but we went up for it because, you know, you, you need some encouragement now and then, and, uh, and he was there speaking. Well, he's a pastor from a thriving church in New York City, 
And he shared some things with us as leaders that day that have lingered in my heart. You know, sometimes you, you hear stuff and we all hate to say it, but it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And if you asked a week later, what did you hear? You, you know, for, for those of us who are getting older, you ask a day later and you can't, you can't remember what, what God said. But I have to tell you that what he shared on this occasion has lingered in my heart. Um, I was taking notes as fast as I could on that occasion, and I finally gave up uh, because I just couldn't keep up because there was so much good stuff coming out uh, in, in a river, and I just couldn't, couldn't get it all down in printing. And I thought, well, they always record these things, right? And, and I thought, well, I'll just not bother taking notes and just get, you know, the recording. So, I don't know, it was a week or two after the event, I, I, I tried to get the recording. Well, we don't know where it's at. We don't know, uh, you know, anyways, I had a difficult time coming up with it, and it was only in the last little bit of time that I was able uh, to come across them and kind of review some of the things that got shared. So I tell you all that to say that because this, uh, this word that got shared with us back in October has been lingering in my heart and I've been ruminating on it for some time, uh, I just want to say some of what you're going to receive this morning is that which is distilled into something I feel I would like to share with you today. Last week, I touched briefly on a verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. I have it for you here on the screen. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. I think it would be helpful in order for this verse to have any meaningful impact on our hearts that we should ask ourselves the question, why did Paul write that? That the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. So best know why he wrote what he wrote and has said what he has said and has reached our ears today, it would be beneficial for us to understand what was going on in the moment at the time when he had to write a sentence like that. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with uh, how things unfolded in the Bible, after Jesus ascended back to heaven, the... the uh, believers, his earliest followers, began to launch out and spread the gospel. As time unfolded, one such person who had a miraculous conversion was Saul, who became known now as Paul in the New Testament, started to go on missionary journeys. And he, he eventually did three of them that we know of uh, in the, over the course of time, where he would go from place to place and town to town, bringing the gospel to bear, hoping to have uh, people who would receive the gospel and, and possibly even plant a church in that area. And so if you were to go back and you were to read, um, for, for example, if you were to go back and, and you were to read in the book of Acts, you will find that after Saul's conversion... On his second missionary uh, journey, one of the places he ended up landing at was a, a city named Cor Corinth. And we, we know that he made a consider this is Acts 18, by the way, you could go and read it if you'd like. It tells us in that passage that Paul made a considerable investment in seeing a church there born in Corinth, so much so that he ended up staying there for a year and a half. So he wasn't like, you know, on some circuit and just touched down there and boom, on to the next place. Not a year and a half. And a year and a half is a long time. I mean, that, that's a significant 
segment of time to, to place yourself someplace, especially in that context, to see a church give birth to and to, um, you know, see it start to thrive. After that period of time, he then went on to wherever he felt God was calling him to next. In his absence, other, other people came in behind him and began to take the church in directions that Paul would not have done, right? And the flavor of the Christian community there at Corinth started to take on a flavor that wasn't of to his liking. And he's the founding guy. He's the guy who gave birth to this local church. So what we have in Scripture are two letters that got written to that church in his absence and as his effort at trying to bring a course correction to the direction that they were taking. You got it? And in that first letter, he is addressing some of his concerns. And uh, before you read uh, the uh, verse that I just that we that I had for you there on the screen, that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. He says in verse the verses right before. Remember, this is a letter he's writing in hopes that it will. J- uh, uh, convince them to think about changing their ways, right? So just a couple of verses before the one I've been quoting to you, he says this, some of you have become arrogant. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. Then he says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. A spirit of pride, a spirit of arrogance had found its way into the church and and it, and it led Paul to say, listen, you can boast, you can talk, you can whatever, 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 but the kingdom of God is not about that. It's about power. I think, we, I think if we were honest with ourselves, at least I'm trying to be honest with myself, I think we can, we can say there has been more talk than power in the church. Now, I'm not just talking about our local church. I'm particularly talking about the American church. There has been more talk than power. There needs to be less talk and more power. Dare I say there needs to be less pride and more power. Less of us and more of him. So my question that I want to talk to you about today, how can we position ourselves in such a way that there would be an increase of God's power in us and through us, so that what we bring to the table in this world is is more compelling than it is right now. More compelling. To begin with, I would, would, here's what I want to say to you. I'm going to say something, and then I'm going to go what seems to be in a completely different, different direction but I'm, I'll get back to it, okay? So to begin with, I believe we need to have a healthy understanding of authority. Authority. Now, I'm going to, like I just said, I'm going to go, I'm going to start talking about something different, 
but it'll all come together here in just a minute or two, all right? The Oxford Dictionary defines power as the ability to do something or act in a particular way, the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. This is the Oxford uh, Dictionary. You could try uh, Webster's probably, I just happened to come across this one as a first choice, and I just grabbed this one. Now, if you were to take that def definition and you were to simplify it, I put it this way. Power is the enabling you have to do something that, Lord willing, has a positive effect on someone else. I'm going to say that again. Simply put, power, power is the ability or enabling that you and I have to do something that hopefully, in turn, has a beneficial effect on someone else. Power. All of us in here, there's not one person in here that does not have ability. Nobody. You were born with ability. Everybody has ability. I wrote down some of the things that I knew were in this room. Obviously, I can't, I can't tell them all, but I, 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 I wrote down some of them. Some of you here today have the ability to run a farm. Some of you have the ability to run heavy equipment. Some of you know how to drive a bus. Some of you know how to cook. Some of you take pictures. Some of you paint. You sew. You teach. You counsel. You write. You speak publicly. You make someone smile. You speak a word of encouragement. You lead. All of us in this room have some kind of ability. Power is being able to take that ability and cause it to influence, hopefully for the good, other people. Some of us have, we have multiple abilities. You don't just have one ability, you have multiple abilities, right? 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 You have multiple abilities. Like, okay, I, okay, I only cook. That's all I do. I just cook. That's all. That's all. I don't do anything. I'll cook. I, if I'm not cooking, I'm not doing. Right? I'm, you, we do other stuff. Right? Like, I, my wife, in the midst of planting her garden, I don't garden. I don't want that ability. I don't... But yesterday, she said, can you help me get the fence around it? And so and so on. Okay. I, and I took my ability, and I went out there, used my power ability to help put the fence up to benefit, right, my wife. That's what I'm doing. I, I, but, but I can do some other things besides put a fence up around a garden. We have multiple abilities, right? All right, now, some of us take maybe one of our abilities to use for purposes of creating wealth. You have a job. You, God's given you the ability to do whatever that job is, and because you get paid for Using that ability, you, uh, you create wealth. They actually call it the power to generate wealth. That's what that's called. Taking your ability and being paid for it gives you power to generate wealth. You got it? I want to say on a side note, 
Of course, all of us have the ability to do some other things that are not so helpful that also have most, most usually a negative effect on others. Do you understand what I just said there? Like you have the ability, the power to make life miserable for somebody. And sadly, more people than ought to use that power for destructive ways. God has gifted us with ability, power, so that we can have a positive influence and make a meaningful contribution to the people and world around us. Now, as it pertains particularly to the kingdom of God, God is telling us in his word that he wants to increase, intensify, and even improve our natural God-given power or the ability to do something by giving to us his supernatural power, his divine ability to do stuff, to accomplish the missions he has set out for us in life. He has given us stuff to do. Not just Pastor Jeff. He's given all of us stuff to do. And then he gives us the divine enabling, the ability, the power to do that. I, I got the right crowd. I, um, okay, so here's some of the things that he's called us to do, to tell people the good news, to train people to be effective followers of him, to baptize people, to pray for evil influences to be broken over the lives of people, to pray for people to get well physically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what he's called all of us to do. Remember, when the Holy Spirit fell last week at Pentecost, it tells us that two symbols of, fire, of power came into that room. One was a wind that filled the whole room. Everybody, there was a corporate thing there. They all felt the wind of God's power and presence. But then it says, they noticed what looked to be like little tongues of fire on each individual. So this isn't about me just having power. This is about us having power to do what God has called us to do. Now here's the thing. It has to start with you and I having a healthy comprehension and understanding of authority. Here's why. You see, power is the ability to do stuff. Authority is the right to use that power. God has given us Power. But we must have an understanding of authority. John Tyson, this guy I was telling you about, gave a great example. I want to show you a picture here this morning. If, Dave, if you could put that up there. Thank you. Now, this is not the actual lady. All right? This was, uh, thank you, Pastor Josh, an AI-generated picture huh? of, a, of, a, of a lady in New York City that John described. He called her the Queen of 42nd Street. That's her name. That's her. She's known by that, right? She is the Queen of 42nd Street. He described her as a five-foot African-American, just a little bitty, short little bitty lady, African-American woman, 
on the streets of, on 42nd Street uh, there in the city. Now, this woman, by, by the way he tells it, has tremendous power. Even though she is short in stature, this woman wields great influence. She has the power to keep the flow of human traffic and vehicle traffic flowing in the proper way. She's in the middle of this intersection, you know, going, bing, 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 like this, moving people and cars, keeping it flowing, right? So there she is. Now, how many of you know that any of the, the vehicles that come down along her, her way there could squash her like a bug? <laughs> Done. Over. <laughs> but when she says stop, they stop. The reason... She has such influence is because she has been given authority over that, that section of New York City, particularly the traffic flow. If you and I decided right now, hey, let's hop in our car, and we're going to drive to that particular intersection and we park our car someplace and we get out and we start blowing a whistle and doing stuff like this, people are going to start going like this. You know what I'm saying? And the other one too. They are not going to pay attention to us and quite literally, it's likely we get run over. You know why? You can say, well, I can do that. I, you know... Then she boop, 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 dee, pop, pop. You could say, I can do that. I got power to do that. I got ability to do that. Yeah, the problem is you don't have the authority. We don't have the authority. And if we walk in there and we say, well, I believe I have the authority, somebody's going to say, you're nuts. <laughs> what, 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 where did you come from? She has been given authority to display her ability or power, and it works. It works for her. All right? This lady exercised authority because the police force above her has said, Queen, you're it. You, that's your thing right there. You do that. You go down and blow your whistle and stuff. We see this same dynamic of authority and power at play in the life of Jesus, in Jesus' ministry. For example, in Matthew 21, 23, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him and asked, by what authority are you doing these things? They didn't ask about his power or ability. Now, the, 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 he says, who, they go on to say, who gave you authority? Who gave you the authority? That these things that they are referencing at this point are the things that he's been doing. The power that has been disseminated, Right? Things like healing, if you go to that section of Scripture, he's been healing people. He rode into Jerusalem as though he were a king. He was bringing correction to the, the practices in the temple. And now they're saying, who gave you the authority to do such things? They wanted to know who authorized that. Now, in Jesus' response... To that question, he gives us two possible sources of authority. There's three in total, but in this moment, he's going to give us uh, the answer. Uh, he's he's going to, instead of answering their question, he asks them a question. This is what he says. John's baptism, which they were all familiar with, meaning the chief priests and elders, and they had kind of, you know, as John was doing his thing, they kind of... 
you know, wink, wink, okay, you're going to do what you're going to do, and we'll just keep our mouths shut, and you go, go ahead, do whatever little thing you're going to do. John's baptism, he says to them, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or men? If you know that part of the Bible, you'll know that Jesus trapped them because either way they answered that question, they were in trouble. I haven't got time to talk to you about that, but it, no matter how they said, whether they said it was from above and from God or whether it was from men, they were in trouble, right? But in his, in their, in his question, he gave us two possible sources of authority. Authority can come from heaven, divine, godly, or in this moment, he says, or did it come from men? Is it of human origin? Did some other human being give you the power and authority to do these things? When my mom and dad stayed with us a few years ago, uh, <clears throat> I was given authority by them, from them, to be involved in their money matters. Anybody know what they call it? Power of attorney. Right? This was a human-to-human -human transfer of authority. We had to fill out some paperwork. I had to sign. They had to sign. There was all, you know, there's a, and all of a sudden, I had the ability to exhibit power on their behalf because they had given me authority. You can't just walk into the bank and say, hey, uh, I woke up this morning and decided I wanted to be power of attorney over Denny Ortel's business. <laughs> Hallelujah, Denny said, yeah. I just looked over and you were sitting there, sorry. You can't do that. You can't say, I, I want that, I need that, I have to have that. It doesn't matter, because if he don't give it to me, I ain't got it. And you can exert no power unless you have the authority. Got it? It's just how it works. Jesus had authority from heaven that enabled him to to the ability to do the stuff he was doing. Power was released and stuff happened because he had authority from above. Now, I just want to say, I'm not going to speak about this, preach about this, but I have to tell you, in the Bible it is clear there is a third option of authority. But again, it's not my focus of my teaching this morning. Maybe sometime I can talk to you about it. But Satan can have a part in delegating authority to situations, people. But I want to say, as I say that, I want to say, let us not be confused. It is not as though Satan and God are duking it out for authority and power over the universe. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, in referencing God's incomparably great power, he says this, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one, one to come. It says here, far above, say far above. All authority. Okay, so this isn't like, you know, uh, you see, part of, part of why the evil one is able to do what he's able to do is that part of what was rendered, uh, part of what happened at the fall of mankind and as the curses were being dealt out, Satan got a limited amount of authority in this world. But when you compare the two things, what can I compare it to? I, I don't even know. Okay, so here we go. 
Here's Satan's authority, right? Now, picture this pen next to the Empire State Building. That's what we're talking about. Right? Here's the, and here, you know, that's the incomparable great power of God. The two are not even in the same uh, zip code, right? They are, he is far and above. It's not even close. Never be confused about that. People are like, sometimes like, well, I'm not sure. You know, it seems like Satan's got the upper hand here. Listen, he only, he can only do what God gives him permission to do. Yeah. It, that's it, right there. Burr! The line gets drawn. Oh, you've gone that far. That's all the farther you're going. Are you still there? I want, not, let it never be said that Jesus came back to get God's authority he did not come here to earth because somehow God lost his authority and he came to get it back. What Christ did come to get back is our authority. Now here is what I want you to see. I've said all of that, so I hope you'll hear this. If you embrace Jesus Christ in your life, if you come to know Jesus and are living in the reality of what that means, you have been given authority. It's often referred to as the authority of the believer. Jesus, when he was talking to those earliest followers, he said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now he is about to delegate authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He says some other stuff, but I'm going to end, end it for our purposes right there. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and evangelize the world. Go and, go and spread the good news. Go and, and see the sick recover. Go and see demons cast out. Go, go out there and do the stuff. I'm giving you authority to do that. I have all authority. I'm giving you delegated authority now to go do the stuff. Jesus, with all authority, delegates authority to do stuff on his behalf. Remember the queen of 42nd Street? She's not out there on her own uh, you know, ability and power and whatnot. She is out there by the authority of the police department. You have to understand that. You have to grab hold of that. The reason we're not moving, sometimes we're not moving in power is you think, well, I don't have any authority. Yes, you do. You have authority. It's been, if you believe in Jesus, if you're living in the reality of it, if your heart is pointed every day towards him and you're going after him, he says, you're some of those people whom I'm sending to do the stuff. Now, listen. Here's, this, is, this is critical. Critical. There is a clear connection and nexus, I'll call it, between knowing authority and power. Knowing authority and power. You don't give authority and subsequently power to someone you don't know. And in most cases, know well. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, just recently, uh, my two granddaughters, I think I can say this publicly. My two, my two granddaughters, Lee and Sherry Ames, are away on vacation. My two granddaughters have been watching their home. Right? They have given them authority and some power, I assume. You're feeding a dog and doing some other things, right? 
Lee and Sherry Ames, down in Charlotte, North Carolina, at this moment, I don't know if you're listening, they're, they're, they're getting ready to watch the race, but so they're probably not listening. They're down there, right? But they transferred, they delegated authority to my two granddaughters to watch over and take care of their place in their absence, right? Now, what I want you to notice is that Lee and Sherry Ames did not go downtown to the streets of Arcade and find somebody walking along the street there and say, hey, we're going away for a week or so. Hey, what do you think about coming and moving into our house and taking care of our stuff? They didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? Because they didn't know them. They don't know them. Are you there? And, and they don't know them, and you could, you could extrapolate, I don't know if I can trust them. Aha! There it is. There it is. It's not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. Some of you, I know you're this way. You will only let certain people babysit your kids. You know, when my wife and I were raising little kids, if blood flowed in your vein, you're good enough. Come on in. Come on in. We, we didn't, you didn't have to be a blood relative to watch my kids, okay? We were so desperate to get out and do something fun. We used to tell the babysitter, listen, if, if they ain't bleeding, don't call us, all right? If you're, the only time to call us is when you're in the middle of mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Give us a shout, you know? We'll see if we're going to come home or not. <laughs> but it, but in, all, in all seriousness, you don't give people that kind of authority unless you know them. Right? I don't want to say we didn't know that we knew people. Yeah, Shanda was one of our babysitters way back then. Look, see how she turned out. She's okay. She's not... <laughs> Gail, is she done? No, I didn't think so. Okay. I want to read to you. I'm almost done. I want to read to you something here. I got to find it. Here it is. There's a very interesting passage here. Um, never heard a sermon about it in my life, but if you've read through the Bible, you've obviously read this. It says here in Acts chapter 19, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. They tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish uh, chief priest, were doing that. One day, an evil spirit answered them, and he said, Jesus I know, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had an evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. What I want you to see about that is there is this connection between knowing authority and power. After Saul's conversion, later in that same chapter, in chapter 9, verse 22 says, Paul grew more and more powerful.
If you, if you read on in the book of Acts, you'll find out. Think about this for just a second. They were, they were doing stuff that people were trying to figure out whether they were divine beings or not. I don't think there's anybody wondering whether any of us in here are divine beings or not. But do you understand what I'm trying to say? There was such a blurred line that they were going to start making sacrifices to them and worshiping them because they were moving about in such influential ways and doing, exhibiting power because the authority was so great upon their lives. We all know that Paul knew who Jesus was before his conversion. But I got to believe that after he really came to know Jesus, he didn't stop getting to know him more. And I think part of our, our, our lack of whatever that is is because we have, we have preached a gospel that says, listen, you know, you just get your heart right so you make sure you're going to heaven. You're good. You're good. It's all good. And what I'm suggesting to us this morning is if we want to increase in power, we need to know him more. We need to spend time knowing him. And also the flip side of that, allowing him to know us. Remember, this is a, called a relationship. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And some of the time, I wonder if God's not... Is, if, uh, anyways, I, I know I'm getting over time here. Hold on. Here we go. Authority and power come from knowing. We position ourselves to increase and empower by knowing God more. The equation looks like this. More knowing equals more authority, and more authority equals more power. Paul, when he was writing to the church at Ephesus, listen to what he prayed for them about. He said, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Why would he pray such a thing? Because he knew that there was a direct correlation between them knowing him better and them being able to move in greater power. There's no way around this thing. Now this morning, I'd like to close. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. We're going to sing you out this morning. But before we do that, I want to close by doing something. I don't know if I've done it here in our service service it's been a super long time since we have. I'm going to invite you to stand with me, all right? And then the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, if you don't already know, I'm going to invite you to ask the name of the person on the right and left of you. Just ask their name right now. Go ahead. If you don't know what their name is, ask them their name. All right, thank, that's good, that's good, that's good. Now, <clears throat> I would like us to bring our service to an end this morning by, remember, this is, a, this is about us doing this. Us knowing him more. Us understanding and comprehending the authority that he's given. Us moving in power. So what I'm going to ask you to do is find your way across the aisle. I'm going to ask you to hold hands of the person next to you. If you're a guest here among us, and please, I'm not going anywhere weird. We're not doing anything crazy. Okay, so you know the person that you're holding hands with. 
I'm going to ask that you would, together we would lift our voices in doing nothing more than what Paul just prayed for for the church at Ephesus. That you would pray for the person on the left and right of you that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation on their life. That they would come into a place of knowing Jesus more. You can pray that uh, that they would understand the authority as believers they've been given and that they would they would take the abilities that God both the natural abilities and any divine abilities that God has graced you with and they would begin to start using them stepping out in faith believing God to release his authority and power But it starts with knowing. If you don't know, and if you don't know him better, then you're you're trying, it just hinders what God can do through us. So go ahead, lift your voices. I'm going to pray for these folks up here. But lift your voices up. Pray for the people to the right and left of you.
your love, more of your power at work in our lives, Lord. More of you. More love. More power. More of you in my life. More love. More power. More of you in our lives. from this place. We, we need the tending work of your Holy Spirit. Otherwise, this exercise has been just futile in nature. We're going to exit the building and go back to the way things were before we came in here this morning. Get up. Do the stuff. Never check in with you. Never know you. We're just, and we'll still be We'll be wondering, why isn't this or this or this happening? Lord, help us as we go from this place to know you more. Whatever that means, to go away from here hungry, thirsty, changing our schedule, making time to know you more. We want you to be able to trust us. We want you to be able to, to know. We want you to know that we're going to handle whatever you give us to do in a way that would honor you, that would please you. It's all about you. 
we need your help. Go with us as we go from this place. Amen.